the sheer brutality of these murders earmarked them as something different. We couldn't believe that the injuries could have been done by somebody of sane mind. They weren't satisfied with killing them. They had to torture them. But somewhere in this country at the moment, there is a serial murder being reenacted. Between 1963 and 1965, the bleak landscape of Saddleworth Moor became the burial site for the bodies of four murdered children. They were all victims of Britain's first serial killing couple, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. I think the reason that um, Brady and Hindley chose children is because they were easy. Um, they, children bring with them a vulnerability. I have never, ever come across anything in my lifestyle, lifetime, like what these people did to these children. Sexual sadists, in my opinion, are the great white sharks of sexual predators. Saddleworth Moor lies to the east of the great sprawling metropolis of Manchester. In its shadow is the market town of Ashton under Lyne. It was here, on Saturday, November the 23rd, 1963, that a young boy disappeared. When the news came over that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated, seconds afterwards, a telephone rang, and uh, Joe Mounty, or one of the officers from downstairs, said, don't go home, we've got a kid missing. And that was young lad Kilbride and he'd gone missing on the market one Saturday afternoon without any reason at all. The market ground was only about 10 or 12 minutes walk from where I lived. When the stalls were ready for packing up at night, he'd help out. By this time, his friends had already gone home. He was always home for tea time without fail. And after an hour had gone by, we knew there was something wrong. He was never late, never. We knew something had happened. And later on that night, my mother phoned the police. That, of course, sparked off a massive search. The whole area was swept. People were asked to check coal houses and outhouses, the usual thing. Police had a picture of John on lampposts, trees, buildings, windows, everywhere. Have you seen this boy? And nobody had seen him, nobody. There was absolutely no uh, clue at all. The boy had just disappeared off the face of the earth. But 12-year-old John Kilbride was not the first child to disappear without trace from the streets around Manchester. Four months earlier, 16-year-old Pauline Reed had gone missing on her way to a dance. The children had been abducted by two sexual sadists intent on murder. Myra Hindley was, was driving a, a vehicle. She was alone in the vehicle. Ian Brady was actually driving along behind on a, on a mot motorcycle. And they were really um, cruising around the streets looking for a child to abduct. When Myra uh, stopped and spoke to Pauline Reed. She asked Pauline to get in the van and she realised that Pauline Reed was in fact a neighbour and they knew one another. The excuse was, the pretext was, that uh, she'd lost a glove on Saddleworth Moor and asked Pauline if she would help her find it. So of course Pauline Reed didn't hesitate to get in the van and go along with her. The pattern, generally speaking, is they start taking victims close to where they live or, or operate on a routine basis, and then they move uh, their victim selection out of their circle of uh, comfort for, for obvious reasons, so police do not link them to the crimes. Pauline Reed didn't see Ian Brady until they reached Saddleworth Moor. It was only then that Hindley introduced uh, Brady to Pauline Reed. And Brady and, and uh, Reed then walked up onto Saddleworth Moor on the pretext of looking for this glove, whilst Henley um, effectively kept a lookout. 
she knew exactly what what Brady was going to do. That he, he was planning to murder the child, whoever it was that they abducted. Sometime later, Brady returned to uh, the vehicle. This is Henley's account, of course, and took Mary Henley up on to the moor and clearly saw that uh, Pauline Reed had been murdered. Having entrapped her into the first murder, she was his forever. They were now united by the most absolutely evil act that anyone can perform, which was to kill not just anybody, but an innocent child. Brady then buried the body um, on the moor, and they returned uh, back to Manchester. Four months later, Brady and Hindley returned to the moor. This time, their car contained John Kilbride. The boy they had just abducted from the market was to be their second victim. When you consider the victims that were chosen by Brady and Hindley, you may find yourself asking, well, they're not all the same sex, so where's the sexual element? Firstly, they choose victims of opportunity. So they take what they can get up to a point. But much, much more importantly is to understand that the sexual element is subsidiary to the sadistic element. It doesn't matter whether it's a boy or a girl, as long as the control and the pain is something that you can taste. Thank God I must have been what you felt to all your up here in the dark and with somebody six times bigger than him, two people six times bigger than him. God, what goes to a child's mind? Ian Brady had been brought up in the tenement blocks of Glasgow. At 16, he moved south to Manchester. He was the uh, slick-haired uh, rock and roll type who enjoyed jazz and uh, was quite a handsome young man striking on his motorbike driving around the back streets of Manchester. In 1959, Brady took a job at Chemical Distributors. Here he met Myra Hindley for the first time. It's fair to say that in the early days uh, she was utterly besotted by this man. Um, uh, uh, and uh, he totally ignored her for many months. Four years younger than Brady, and at one time a devout Catholic who had wanted to become a nun, Hindley fell madly in love with the handsome Scot. She says that in the early stages she, she was uh, head over heels in love with this man, uh, but only realised later on that, that he was actually a very dangerous man, but of course uh, she was she was in, involved with him then. By June 1964, Brady and Hindley were more than just involved. They had killed two children. They now took to the streets again in search of another young victim. I think you have to ask why children of the age that they chose. Well, if you have children that are very much younger than that and you hurt them, they are certainly hurt and they cry in response to pain. But they have to be just a little older to recognise and understand the awfulness of the situation that they're in. And somewhere they have to know that the pain is going to go on and they're going to die. And that's a very important part of the sadistic control that these people would have had. On this, their third hunt, Brady and Hindley caught 12-year-old Keith Bennett. He was a simple kiddie. He, he wasn't a kiddie to cause trouble. It was his birthday on the Tuesday. He was 12 years of age. He was sleeping at his grand's on Tuesday night. I t took him to the zebra crossing. I said, I'll see you in the morning. And that's when they must have picked him up in the van. 
in one of the side streets or one of the entries. All Winnie Johnson knows for certain is that her son was driven up onto the moor. The rest she has been forced to piece together from the details of the other murders. And when they got him up to the moors, Brady walked him up and down. He tried to run away, kid. He realised he'd got to be in him for eight o'clock. And of course he ran after him, threw something at the back of his head, knocked him out and then got a machine belt, put it round his throat, tied a knot in it at the back and broke his neck. Then interfered with him and then buried him. But with their next murder, Brady and Hindley were to reach even greater depths of depravity. On that particular Christmas in 64, the children loved it because they had everything they wanted, because I was working. And uh, bought a um, nice little sewing machine, which she treasured. One of those little battery things, but it actually worked. She was over the moon. Leslie was a typical 10-year-old um, innocent child. She was a loving child. She was a picture. She was an angel. And then Leslie said um, she would like to go to the fair on uh, Boxing Day. She said she was going with Mrs. Clark and her two children and her children. So we said, are you sure? She said, yeah. So we said, well, that's okay then. But when Leslie's brother returned from the fair without her, the family began to panic. So we went out to look for ourselves, all around the fair, looking at different children who we thought looked like. Leslie from the back, but obviously when the child turned around, it wasn't theirs. So I went to Mill Street Police Station just after five o'clock and reported it that um, Leslie was on the fair and she hadn't come home, which she said she would be home for five o'clock. So um, he looked at us as if we was daft. Um, he said, look, he said, if I had that many parents come in when the child was missing just an hour or so, so we'd be out of her mind, we'll worry. So I said, what to do? He said, go home. And he said, I can assure you that if you went home, she'd be in. She'd be on waiting for you. So that eased us a bit. Went home. No, Leslie. It never occurred to us that Leslie was dead. Leslie Ann Downey had become the fourth victim of the Moors murderers. Hindley said that um, what she was doing, uh, she'd walk around with his box, a drink, and she'd pretend it was too heavy and she was dropping it, and Leslie was standing there on her own. So uh, Hindley's supposed to turn around to her, Leslie, and said, uh, would you help me to carry these to my car? They pushed Leslie in, so then Hindley got in and they drove up. Unlike the other children, Leslie Ann Downey was not taken straight to Saddleworth Moor. Instead, she was taken to Myra Hindley's home, 16 Wardlebrook Avenue in Hattersley. There she was killed, but not before Hindley and Brady had taken photographs and tape recorded her final agonizing moments. We came across a photograph of a little dark haired girl who was lying in her bed, and she was gagged. The tape starts, and you can hear the child being tortured. You know the child's not play acting. And you can tell by her voice, Hindley's voice on it, that she's not play acting either. She is telling this kid what he's gonna do. And the child begging, really to be, you know, let me go. You know, wants to go home, wants to go, you know, she's not telling anybody. The tape has never been played in public. Its contents deemed too shocking. That tape was obviously run at the same time as that kid who was on the bed. 
makes the hairs on your back of your neck stick up. And I can't really think of anything else that does that to me. You have to understand what the tape recordings were. We know that serial killers sometimes take trophies, they take parts of their victims, and sometimes they take souvenirs. They take something to remember them by. The recordings actually combine both of these things together. It means that you don't have to just relive it in memory, in fantasy, where things are not always as clear as they might be. All you've got to do is press the button and you're back there. You can hear it, what's really happening. And remember, we're not looking just at sexual perversion. We are looking at sadism. And the heart of sadism is the pleasure that comes from the control and the domination of the other person and from the pleasure gained through their pain, through their terror. And every time you play the tape, you go back there. The tiny body of Leslie Ann was taken up onto the moor and buried close to the body of Pauline Weed. It was just 17 months since they had killed their first victim here on the moor. Being able to see the moors from their homes is not without its significance. What it means is they could be in everyday conversation with anybody they like, just like you or me now. They've only got to turn their heads and they're looking at the thing that gives them the most pleasure of all. In a sense, it's the biggest souvenir they could get. There it is. And they hadn't finished yet. On the 7th of October, 1965, the police received a call from a telephone box in Hattersley. The caller said he wanted to report a murder. Bored with killing alone, Brady and Hindley had decided to bring a third person into their murderous partnership. We know that from earlier days, Brady would like to have been running a little group and I'm quite sure that Hindley, although she would talk of being besotted by Brady, would also find that her own appetites for company broaden. So bringing someone else in is a way of simply sharing and exploring and enhancing the pleasure that's to be had. He wanted to create a cult that was designed to kill. He had entrapped Myra and his fatal mistake was to try and entrap David Smith who was supposed to join the killing cult. That's where it went wrong. David Smith was Myra Hindley's brother-in-law. Hindley had called round the night before to take him to meet up with Brady at Wardlebrook Avenue. Here he was introduced to a young man called Edward Evans. Brady and Hindley claim to have met him at Manchester Central Railway Station. Now Smith looked on in horror as Brady killed the 17-year-old. What had happened, like, actual fight, was that Brady had hit young Edward Evans with an axe in the head. When we arrived, the door was answered by Hindley. There was no sense of alarm, no sense of fear, surprise, anything. Just cool, calm and collected. Um, she just dealt with the situation and walked straight through there and walked straight into the lounge where Brady was sitting. Um, I've got to say he wasn't even phased either. He just he was in bed there and, and I call his little fag and smoked a fag one. It was all going on round about. And in there we found the body of uh, young Edward Evans. He was a young lad and he was trussed up in really in a fetal position uh, in a plastic bag in the bedroom. In the other bedroom was um, Hindley's grandmother. She was in bed oblivious to what was going on. Brady was arrested for murder. He admitted that the previous night that he had um, killed young Edward Evans. Um, Blasé, that was it. 
And that was the last words he spoke to us. Hindley refused to admit any involvement in the crime. All she ever said, and I mean, it sticks, sticks in my brain. The only thing you ever heard was saying was, Ian didn't do anything, I didn't do anything, we didn't do anything, and I'm not saying anything. I mean, and, and that's all we ever got out of her. And yet Ian had just told us a few minutes previously that um, he'd split a fellow open with an axe. She was as cold, ice cold. I honestly could say that I've never met anybody who was quite in control of what she was doing in circumstances like that. The police had a body and the murderers. And according to David Smith, the pair had boasted that this was not the first time they had killed. That's Hyde Police Headquarters, the center of one of the biggest ever police search operations in this country. Inside now, detectives are studying a police file, which day by day grows in content. And it's collecting evidence which might confirm the killings of young children up on the Pennine Moors about seven or eight miles from here. And police have taken away from the left luggage department at Manchester Central Station two suitcases. They were stacked, absolutely stacked with Nazi memorabilia, stuff from Mark they said, there was negatives, photographs, magazines. We came across a photograph of a little dark-haired girl and the television was on in the corner. And they were pushing out the fact these children missing from home in Manchester. Then they flashed the photograph on the television and that was Leslie Ann Downey. And that was a little girl who was on the bed, tied. You could, there was enough there, although she was gagged with this um, cut scarf, this barn scarf, there was enough there that you could tell that was Leslie Ann Downey. The only clue to the location of Leslie Ann was a plan Brady and Hindley had drawn up for the disposal of Edward Evans' body. It had been their intention to dispose of the body of Edward Evans on the moors because there was a plan in, written out in their handwriting um, as to what was going to be done in relation to that body. The police from three counties, along with hundreds of volunteers, now searched the moors for the bodies of the missing children. The officers were issued with sticks or metal rods to stick in to the peat. We stuck it in and pulled it out and had a sniff. And the theory being, if it was decomposed bodies under there, you would smell it. And that was the full technology of the search. After searching all day up there, it was just a blank. Nothing was found. The main search was called off. But Superintendent Joe Mounsey, the man in charge of the hunt for John Kilbride, refused to give up. He sent his officers back up to the moor. The next day, I had an area of the search was towards the bottom of the hill. And for some reason, something was dragging me up to the top. I was ready to pack up, and I decide that I'll go up the top and have a look. And after I've been up the top, looking, and I'm on my way back down, I saw something sticking out of a depression in the peat. There was a, a hollow that was filled with body-coloured water, and what just looked like a withered stick. So got the spades and that, back out the buses, we turned up the hill, whereupon we gradually drained the water. I'd taken a, quite a bit of stick in a, from certain other senior officers that was there saying, you know, we could have been off home but for you. And he was of the opinion it was a sheep. And at that point, the soil was moved away and I'd seen some material and I just told them, well, if that's a sheep, it's wearing clothes. The body of Leslie Ann Downey had been found buried just 70 yards from the road 
and less than two feet below the surface of the moor. There's a knock on the door. And there's police there, playing have CID. And they come to break the news that the body that had been found was of a little girl. And um, we went down to go identify her. As she walked into the mortuary, um, on the left hand side in the corner was they had his clothes all folded up. Uh, all the little trinkets, like a little necklace and what have you. She knew by just looking at, at the clothing and the trinkets that it was that it. But she had to go through the formality of being taken to where Leslie was laid out, which there was only half of her showing her face. Only half of the small child's body had been preserved in the peat. The withered stick that had made Bob Spears stop in his tracks was in fact the bone of her forearm that sticking out of the peat had decomposed beyond recognition. But Anne West's torment didn't stop at identifying her daughter's body. We had a tape of a little girl be tortured. We had a picture of a little girl. But I couldn't say it was Lizzie Ann Downey on the tape. So therefore you had to have somebody who knew Lizzie Ann Downey, who knew her well, who could identify the voice of Lizzie Ann Downey on the tape to be adduced in evidence. It said it could be Leslie, but we'd like to make sure. So I um, sat her down and obviously played the tape to her. And it was Leslie crying out for Mummy. And he and Lee said, If you don't stop crying, I'll give you another smack. Tell it to open the mouth wider. It's just torment. I mean, that was enough to kill a child, let alone. Strangling her like they did, the way she, she did die, they strangled her. Mrs West, Leslie's mother, the last thing that that woman wanted to do was to say that that was Leslie Ann's voice on the tape. If there was any doubt in her mind, she'd have said no. Because she didn't want that to be Leslie. But she wasn't any doubt. It had to be done. And yes, we would do it today. We'd, we certainly would do it today. That was Anne's nightmare. 24 hours a day, hearing Leslie and seeing Leslie, both on the photographs and also at the Mall Street. That was her nightmare. She could never close her eyes. They admitted nothing, nothing at all. On the negatives and on the photographs, we found the fingerprints or oh, not. Well, I sp explain that for you. Well, could explain it for you. Didn't want to know. Didn't want to speak to us. There was a mass of negatives, and all these negatives had to be printed. One very interesting negative I remember was one of Myra Hindley kneeling on the moors with a puppy dog looking down at a, uh, an area of ground which looked as though it had been recently disturbed. Joe Mouncey, in particular, was really intrigued by this photograph. He examined it carefully under a, a magnifying glass and he said, she's not looking at the puppy, she's looking down at this patch of earth. I reckon there's a grave there. It suddenly struck Joe Mouncey that there might be a little bit more to see on the photograph. So he charged me with finding this negative and doing another print of the photograph. When I printed the photograph, it was then that you could see that there was Myra, the dog, the stones, but in the background, to the uh, top right-hand corner, 
some very, very distinctive stones. Those stones were hauling brown knoll. And sure enough, there was a body there. It was obviously a boy, and in Joe's mind, and he was subsequently proved right, it was John Kilbride. When my mum was asked to identify the clothing, it was like brought to my parents' attention that the body was too badly decomposed, and literally all what remained was his clothing. And truth be known, I think my parents knew and all. Although they never gave up hope, they were birthday presents, Easter eggs, Christmas presents bought and stored. My mum bought clothes for him, I wouldn't have fitted him anyway. But that's a parent's love for a child, isn't it? If this hadn't have happened, if he hadn't have gone to the pictures that day and on the market, he'd have been. 49 years old today, with a family of his own, just like me. On the 19th of April 1966, Brady and Hindley appeared in court charged with the murder of John Kilbride. They were also charged with the murders of Edward Evans and Leslie Ann. This woman and this fella were couple of police officers walk directly in front of us. So after they'd gone, we didn't know who they were, but after they'd gone past, um, one of the policemen said, um, do you recognise those people? So we said, no. So I said, they're the ones who's uh, been accused of killing Leslie. That's Hindley and Brady. And we never knew, we never knew who it was. Despite refusing to admit either of the child murders, Brady was found guilty on all three counts. Hindley was convicted of the killing of Edward Evans and Leslie Ann Downey. The death penalty had been abolished just six months before, and so the judge sentenced them to life imprisonment. But two children were still unaccounted for. Well, I felt awful. I thought, well, why can't they plead with... Why can't they charge him with Keith and Pauline Ree? And I asked the police that, and they said, well, we we can't charge him because we don't know whether they've had them or not. And despite constant pressure from the families and the media, it would be another 19 years before Brady and Hindley would finally confess to five murders and reveal the location of another gravesite on the moor. In 1985, the newspapers were once again full of stories about the so-called Moore's murders. 19 years after he was convicted of killing three children, Ian Brady was finally talking about his crimes. He agreed that I should start to correspond with him. One day I did offer to visit him and uh, he readily agreed to it. He sent me the visiting order. I was vetted by the Home Office, who seemed to overlook the fact that I was a journalist. Since being imprisoned, Brady's mental health had deteriorated severely. When his drugs were kicking in, uh, there would be occasions when I could barely understand anything that he was saying. I would get a, a high-pitched whining sound coming out of him. Eventually, he was willing to agree that other children had been his victims. It was uh, necessary to identify particular children by name because I couldn't settle for a nod and a wink acknowledgement. In his conversations with Fred Harrison, Brady admitted that as well as murdering Edward Evans, Leslie Ann Downey and John Kilbride, he had also murdered Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett. 
he was using me. He had a mission. His mission was, Myra will never be allowed out of prison. In return, I would get sufficient information to provoke the Manchester police to go out and dig on those moors. He was in love with Myra Hindley. And had she not betrayed his love, he would have happily served his sentence and never uttered a word about any other cases. But he learned quite quickly that uh, she had renounced him. Hindley had enlisted veteran campaigner Lord Longford in her bid to be released from prison. She's um, uh, done very well. She's got a, a Open University degree, a past degree, and then an honours degree, and she's a good many people have come to know her and like her very much. So I, I should say she was completely ready. She has been for years, if it comes to that. She's under no illusion. She, she is well aware that had she not abducted the children, then they, in all probability they would not have gone with, with Brady on his own. Um, so she's under no illusions as to uh, the enormity of, of what she's done, albeit she uh, maintains that she was never physically present when any of the murders were committed. Uh, she was always uh, in another room or, or some distance away or whatever. It's easy to imagine that there must have been a dominant person. There must have been one who led the way and the other quietly acquiesced and went along with it. It's not true. It's not necessary at all. What happened is that they each fueled the other. They each legitimised what the other was doing. They were each able to share the pleasure that they got from what they did. While Brady had confessed all to a journalist, he was still refusing to talk to the police. We decided uh, we'd had a lot of help from psychiatrists and psychologists um, who were used to dealing with uh, characters um, like this. And um, they thought that if we could apply uh, a great deal of pressure, psychological pressure, to, to Brady, uh, for a reasonable period of time. He may just uh, break and, and spill the beans. Conversely, the information we'd received from uh, people who dealt with Mara Hindi was that uh, she was a very hard character, a very difficult character, and, and wouldn't speak to us at all. So the police decided to pretend Hindley had helped them, then announced to the press that they were searching the moors. The idea was then that we would um, search for a, a couple of weeks or so before the, the, the winter weather set in, and then we would would stop the search and, and effectively leave uh, Brady sweating in, in prison for uh, many months over the winter, thinking that we had some, uh, some pretty serious information. Fortunately, this plan uh, went somewhat awry because we, we arrived at Cookingwood Prison. Uh, we went in to see Mara Henley and uh, she very quickly said, well, I'm prepared to speak to you. Uh, I, I'm prepared to uh, talk about places on Saddleworth Moor that were of, of interest, was the term she used. Hindley then issued a statement to the press. I received a letter, the first ever, from the mother of one of the missing children, and this has caused me enormous distress. I have agreed to help the Manchester police in any way possible and have today identified from photographs and maps places that I know were of particular interest to Ian Brady, some of which I visited with him. She kept two old families waiting 20 years to bury the children when she could have said at the trials or a week after or even a year after, not wait 20 years. But Chief Superintendent Peter Topping head of the Manchester CID, would not give up. He went back to the site this year to lead the search in person, usually with a small trowel in hand, arriving each day with a rucksack on his back after long prison... Mr Topping came to see me and said that Myra Hindley had given certain information to him and his colleagues about the possible location of two further bodies. Really, all we wanted to know was, was whether, if we started looking for the missing children on Saddleworth Moor, would the bodies be in any uh, state? You know, would they still be there? If they were still there, what state they would be in? Would we be able to be able to identify them? Because 
DNA was in its DNA uh, technology was in its very early stages at that time. But this time, the police had not returned to the moor alone. The Home Office had finally agreed Myra Hindley could return to the moors. On a Pennine hillside, a police officer armed with a rifle moved into position. It was a massive security operation, 300 officers, many of them armed to protect the convicted killer. When they got up to the Pennines, it was beginning to snow and uh, it was quite misty. She was totally disorientated and just didn't know. She couldn't get her bearings at all. And as we were driving along, she was looking out the window and she, she just pointed to a roadside at one given at the top of her grain and said, that's where we used to, that's where we used to park our car. Uh, and um, we realised, of course, that she could get her bearings from there. So we, we said, OK, you show us where you went and, and how it went from there. But after six hours on the freezing cold moor, Hindley still could not find the grave and she returned to her prison cell. So we went back that evening and spoke to uh, Mary Henley on the telephone and said, could you tell us uh, whether, whether when um, Pauline Reed was murdered and, and, and the body buried, whether it was daylight or dark? And she said, well, I can as a matter of fact because it was just going dusk. She said, I remember looking across the valley and seeing the outline, the silhouette of the of the hills on the opposite side of the valley. And when we got back there, we suddenly realised that there are only certain points on the moor where you can actually see across the valley and see the silhouette of the hills on the other side. So it was a it was a remarkably uh, um, effective piece of information. A quarter of a century after they found the body of ten-year-old Leslie Ann Downey near this bleak spot on Saddleworth Moor police found a third apparent victim of the Moors murderers, despite claims by some experts that it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. We were re really literally digging in a, in a, a line, just walking backwards, uh, when one of my colleagues uh, put a spade into the, into the ground and said, hang on, I've, I've, I've hit something. Uh, and we, of course we stopped immediately and I got a pointing trowel and uh, just moved, moved the uh, Pete away and, and it was clear that there was something there. Uh, I excavated a little further and uh, again just an inch or two inches below the surface and uh, the first thing I saw was a, was a white stiletto shoe uh, which we knew Pauline Reed had been uh, wearing at the time uh, and within seconds it was apparent that there was a foot still in the shoe. She was dressed in clothing which was still recognisable as that which had been described by her relatives at the time of her disappearance. She had been strangled with a ligature. She had a scarf round her neck. The body was well preserved. It was in the condition that I would have expected for a body that was buried in acid conditions. It was quite surprising and rather touching, particularly after the body had been rehydrated and the wrinkles and di had disappeared and the skin had smoothed out, to see this child, and that is what she was, she was little more than a child, on her way to a dance at the local church hall. I think everybody was touched by this. It was the wish of Pauline's parents that the Requiem Mass be held at the monastery church in Gorton where she'd worshipped as a child. Later, her body was interred at a nearby cemetery. More than two decades after her death, her family were at last able to lay their daughter to rest. The moment uh, Peter Topping told Brady that we'd found the body, he dropped all the, condition, all the conditions that he'd uh, tried to be imposed and having time out from prison and as providing him with the means for him to kill himself and so on and so forth and said that he would come to Saddleworth Moor and show us where the other body was buried. We managed to uh, get him up onto the moor. It was done in the early hours of the morning. We learned our lessons from previous mistakes with Mary Hindley's visit 
and um, we asked Brady where he wanted to start from. He started where the stream, the whole grain, flows underneath the road. Brady's quite a tall man and uh, quite thin, uh, and he strode off across the moor in a very determined manner. So much so that uh, we were all toddling along behind, thinking we were on a winner here. Things were going very, very well indeed until we reached a point, perhaps three quarters of a mile or a mile onto the to the moor, when he came out with a, a remark, uh, something to the effect of, um, "Who's moved that hill?" Um, which gave us a touch of the seconds, I have to say. We, uh, we realised perhaps things weren't uh, as rosy as we thought they were going to be. It transpired that he didn't know where the grave was either. He'd lost it. Despite making a second visit to the moor, Brady still could not identify the grave of Keith Bennett. And the experts believe it will never be found. The problem with a body buried in light sandy soil is it will decompose quickly and particularly in the case of a, a young child and the ends of whose bones have not fused, whose bones are still growing, whose skull sutures haven't properly fused, it's very, very quickly skeletonized and in fact the skeleton can decalcify and so you are literally going to be looking for a bony needle in a haystack. We reached a point where we had literally excavated every single gully uh, in those two valleys, uh, uh, and all to no avail. Um, so we were reasonably happy that uh, in one or other we'd uh, probably uh, excavated the grave site, but uh, not found the body. They found Leslie ten months after she was murdered. Then they found John Kilbride and thought, oh, I'll be the next, but it never happened for me. And this is 36 years ago. He'd have been 48 this year. And I could have probably had a young family off him, but which I never got, because they'd taken all that away from him. I'd want him back home, where he should be in a proper grave. I'd been told to have a memorial put up there, but to me, that's not a burial. We've got a grave for him. We can go and visit the grave. My mum goes every week and she still cleans it now every week and she's nearly 70 and she's got somewhere to go now. Winnie Johnson's nowhere to go. Winnie takes flowers up to the moors, puts them in different places, just off the off chance. The point is my lad's still up there and I want him back, no matter what it costs. Is. Well, you could be crook, I'll get him back. And I'm determined to get him back. And I'm determined to see them in, in there for the rest of their lives. The search for Keith Bennett's body was finally called off in December 1987. By that time, Britain's next serial killing couple had already murdered 12. Well, along with Dennis Nilsson, Fred and Rosemary West were responsible for two of the biggest serial murder tolls in British history. And they're the subject of the last in the series of To Kill and Kill Again, next Wednesday at 10.20.